Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. I was recently browsing my Netflix library when I came across the film Mosul. Mosul is a city located in northern Iraq. It's located in an area that's been continuously occupied by human beings since as early as 6000 BC. Like most cities in this ancient part of the world, the local population was made up of a very diverse mixture of people, including Arabs, Kurds, Turksmen, Yazidis, Muslims, Christians, even a few Jews once upon a time. The ancient ruins of the city of Nineveh sit across the Tigris and would have been a popular historical landmark for tourists and scholars to visit had it been located in any other part of the world. Unfortunately, Mosul in recent times has been one of the most dangerous cities in the world because of constant warfare and conflict. Even before Americans invaded Iraq in 2003, Mosul was plagued by sectarian violence. When George W. Bush claimed mission accomplished on May 1st, 2003, marking an end to all major combat operations in Iraq, he didn't really understand that the fighting would continue across the country for many years later. As security and stability continued to collapse across the country, sectarian violence would also emerge. Mosul would find no reprise from the violence. More than a decade later, the militant group known as ISIS or Daesh arises and begins to rapidly take territory in western Iraq and eastern Syria. And then finally, in June 2014, Daesh arrives on the outskirts of Mosul with 1,500 combatants. They faced 60,000 Iraqi government security forces, a mixture of soldiers and police officers. But these are ill-equipped and ill-trained soldiers, and they quickly begin to crumble in the face of the Daesh onslaught of suicide bombers and technicals. You see, Daesh wasn't your typical criminal scum. These were religious fanatics who were led strategically and tactically by former Ba'athist Party members. These were the so-called elite Republican Guard that were supposed to give American forces so much trouble during the 2003 invasion. Trained in elite Iraqi military colleges and then unemployed with the fall of Saddam, this group of Iraq's top military leaders had been waiting silently for this moment to come out of hiding and seize control of the country. Mosul falls to Daesh in less than a week. The terrorists seize multiple military bases with huge stocks of weapons and armored vehicles. At one point, they even managed to seize a few American Blackhawks. Mosul falls to the tyranny of Daesh, and it's one of the worst moments in the city's already pretty tragic history. None of the information that I just talked about is mentioned in the film Mosul. Instead, the film starts with a series of aerial shots of the already devastated city. The reign of ISIS is about to come to an end. There are a few simple sentences about how terrible the Daesh occupation has been, and the rest of the intro mentions the Nineveh SWAT team, who is the main unit featured in this movie. And that's because despite its deep historic and political background, the film Mosul focuses just on the people on the ground. It does not care about all of the different factors in the background that have long affected the city and caused its suffering. This is an intimate story that features real world consequences and decisions that are created by people from far away and deeply affect the people actually living in these places. This movie does not care about the good intentions of American soldiers who had tried to stabilize the region. It does not care about who you, the American voter, elected into office and is now in charge of American foreign policy. No, this is a simple film about the effects of all of these actions. Terrible effects that don't seem to justify even the best of intentions. And so, like its main protagonist, this film Mosul attempts to survive throughout its entire hour and 41 minute runtime. There's very little room for fat and prose, there's very little time to dwell on anything. There is only the mission and then survival. In the first scene, we find one of the main protagonists of the film, Kawa, a local policeman pinned down with two other policemen inside of a restaurant. One of the policemen, Kawa's uncle, is mortally wounded and lying on the ground next to multiple ISIS fighters they have arrested. Outside, multiple Daesh fighters have the building surrounded. They are heavily armed with Kalashnikovs and grenades. The whole scene is absurd. The entire area is bombed out and looks like a war zone. The police are armed with just service pistols and are completely outgunned and out of place. As they exchange fire with the militants outside, the militants they have arrested on the floor inside encourage the attackers on. The police officers only have one or two extra magazines on them and they quickly run out of ammunition. 
Kawa and the other surviving officer armed themselves with sharp objects and prepared to fight to the death. But then the Nineveh SWAT team arrived. Their presence is announced by continuous machine gun fire. It seems like the Nineveh SWAT are the real police presence in this chaotic town. Led by the stoic Major Jassam, there's a noticeable difference between the two groups of police officers. The Nineveh SWAT do not take Dash fighters prisoners, they execute them on site in the same way Dash fighters would execute them. Whereas Kawa's uniform is a simple Kevlar vest with the words police boldly written across them, the Nineveh SWAT team are dressed in all black and wear tactical vests in combat rigs with very little logos or details on them. They carry long guns with jungle-style magazines taped together. Instead of riding around in a beat-up old Merc with police lights, the Nineveh SWAT team roll in a convoy of Humvees mounted with machine guns and decorated with skulls and crossbones. Young Kawa and the regular police are alive. They come from a safe zone, the side of Mosul where rule of law still existed. Now there was a time where the Nineveh SWAT team members would have looked just like Kawa and his unit. A time before Mosul turned into an apocalyptic wasteland. Major Jessam used to be a homicide detective, and one of his appointment used to be one of his students in one of the university classes he used to teach in. This was back when things all used to be normal. We even find out that several of the Dash fighters who attacked Kawa in the opening scene also used to be policemen as well. As a matter of fact, one could argue this first scene is just a bunch of former policemen fighting against each other. After Major Jassam and his men finish off the last Dash fighter, Jassam gives Kawa an opportunity to join his unit. The Nineveh SWAT team has a very peculiar set of recruiting standards. They only accept capable fighters who have either been wounded by ISIS or have lost family members due to them. Kawa, who just recently lost his uncle in the fighting, is given an opportunity to join. And just like that, his Kevlar vest is removed and he's given an AK along with a baseball cap. Suddenly, he's a part of the crew. At first, the Nineveh SWAT team seems like an elite force. They took out all of those dash fighters that were trying to kill Kawa without much hesitation or difficulty. They look badass, and to the untrained eye with their baseball caps, magazine laden tactical vests, and leg strap sidearms, they might even look like special forces operators. These soldiers even seem to move in this urban terrain like they're elite. They stack up at doors, watch all of the corners as they sweep rooms, they have good trigger discipline, and seem to communicate effectively when under fire. But then quickly, the heroes of our film begin to take casualties. It starts off with IED explosions and hidden snipers. A Humvee is then destroyed and another ambush then occurs. Then soon after, a friendly fire incident happens and a poorly thrown grenade almost kills another friendly fighter. The cracks quickly begin to emerge. We begin to notice that most of these fighters aren't even wearing ballistic helmets or Kevlar or trauma plates. It's at this point I begin to ask, who are these individuals? What are they doing? What exactly is a SWAT team? Well, SWAT stands for Special Weapons and Tactics, but they're primarily not a military force, but instead attached to the police. SWAT teams in America are specialized in using military-style hardware and trained in CQB and urban combat. But there are a lot of differences between a SWAT officer and a soldier. For one, SWAT teams do not have military-style logistical support. They don't have much in the way of support vehicles. They certainly don't have the capability to call on heavy weapons and fire support. SWAT teams generally are deployed on a mission and then head back to base immediately after. They carry limited amount of munitions and supplies and aren't designed to operate in a war zone for multiple days on end. This is supposed to be a day job, not a lifestyle. It's at this point I came to a realization that these men of the Nineveh SWAT team are completely out of their elements and they're doing a job that they were ill-equipped or trained for. Like everyone else in the city, these men are extremely desperate and scared, but there's a certain quality to these individuals, and then there's also the hidden motivation which drives each one of these fighters to continue pushing on. As Kawa and the Nineveh SWAT team crisscross through Mosul's unsafe zone, they meet many characters and many factions, all trying to survive in this completely lawless land. They barter for weapons, a hookah for an RPG, cartons of cigarettes for boxes of 7.62 rounds. This no longer is a functional city. Humanity has collapsed here. Mosul resembles a post-apocalyptic sci-fi setting, just minus the aliens and robots. Three quarters of the way throughout the film, we still don't understand the true purpose of the Nineveh SWAT team's mission. All we see is the endless suffering and death this unit has to encounter. 
And from the very beginning, Major Jessam keeps the objectives of their unit's mission a secret. Kawa assumes that the mission must be important because everyone in the units continues fighting on. But the attrition they suffer is horrendous. There used to be six full Humvees of men in their ranks, and by the end of the film, the unit is down to only half a dozen men on foot. Now, we're not going to tell you the reason why these men are fighting, because ultimately I do want you to see this film. It is a terrific movie. Because it does three things that every war film should do. One, it should give you a sense of appreciation for those who are brave enough to be willing to fight for something. The men of the Nineveh SWAT team are admirable in their devotion to one another and their desire to protect what little innocence still survives in the city. Two, a war film should also give you a sense that war is terrible and should be avoided at all costs. What Mazel does particularly well is it quickly builds up characters by using small, intimate moments and then quickly rips them away from us so that we can feel the pain in their loss. And three, a war film should remind us of the few reasons why we should ever pick up a gun and fight. ISIS is a pure evil, the first pure evil humanity has encountered in the 21st century. And while there are several amazing films about the heroics of American soldiers going into Iraq, there are very few films and almost no American films that highlight the suffering of the Iraqis we left behind and are forced to continue to deal with the instability that we have caused there. This movie features an all-Arab cast speaking Arabic. The actor who plays Major Jessam, Suhail Dabakh, used to be a famous actor in Iraq, but after Saddam's brother began censoring the cinemas, Dabak was forced to flee the country to Jordan, and eventually he would make it over to the United States, where he would live in New Mexico and find work as a dishwasher inside of a retirement home. Suhail Dabak was robbed of a career in acting. The only other major role that he had before this film, ironically, was as a suicide bomber in the film Hurt Locker. It's almost poetic justice that a displaced Iraqi like Suhail Dabak would be featured in the first American film that actually looks at the plight of Iraqis from their point of view. Instead of just seeing Iraqis as suicide bombers, terrorists, or helpless civilians, Mosul shows us the Iraqis who decided to stand up and fight back. And more importantly, the story that they tell of the Nineveh SWAT team is not made up. When ISIS swept through Mosul, most of the 60,000 Iraqi government security forces routed and abandoned their positions. Only the Nineveh SWAT team stayed behind and held their position. A group of 80 police officers occupied the Mosul Hotel on the western banks of the Tigris River and managed to hold off multiple Daesh attacks for four entire days. On the fifth day, a massive truck bomb would wound almost a quarter of the unit, forcing them to withdraw, but they would continue fighting against Daesh while everyone else abandoned the city. Almost two decades after American forces knocked down Saddam Hussein's regime and statues, Mosul still lies mostly in ruins and won't recover for several more generations. Daesh is now gone, and the Nineveh SWAT team has also been disbanded. This war in Iraq has been the defining conflict of an entire generation of Americans and Iraqis. It would be a tragedy to forget the toll this conflict had, the thousands of American casualties and tens of thousands of wounded, but also the hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians that were killed in this conflict and the millions that were displaced. It's films like this that I hope will inform future generations of Americans and American voters to understand the impact that our military interventions have on other countries. I mean, sure, I can blame Bush or maybe Rumsfeld and Cheney for the invasion of Iraq, but I equally blame the American people. I mean, I grew up in a commuter town that was heavily connected to New York City. So when the Twin Towers fell down, I remember that every American I knew wanted blood and revenge. Republicans, independents, Democrats, we all had the contagion of blood rage coursing through our veins, the same blood rage that we see drive the various factions in the movie Muzzle. It's important to remember that we aren't helpless in preventing future tragedies like this from occurring, because the actions of a republic are driven not just by its leaders, but by those who make up the voting populace. A film like Mosul is the legacy that we as Americans inherit. And unfortunately, it is the type of movie that American audiences deserve to see. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our coverage. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.